All right. I want you to turn your Bible with me to Mark chapter 8, please. We will be in quite a few different places. I hope that does not frustrate you. I will try to take my time and, and do this. I've even worked with Carol a little bit to try to get a few of these passages up. Whatever we can, we'll try our best to do. Um, so anyway, we're going to lead a lot of scripture, and I'm just trusting God will use his word, and he will open your heart um, or your mind to understand it and your heart to receive that today. How many of you know somebody, man? They, they, they boast a lot about what they can do. Anybody know somebody like that? They talk about how good they are at something and you, you kind of challenge them and you're like, well, if you're this good, well, let's go do this or let's go do that or show me. And yet you've never seen what they so proudly boast to be. Anybody know anybody like that? Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. A few of you do? Okay. I figured you kids might be able to relate to that, you know, being in school. Everybody wants to talk about how good they are at this or that. But, you you know, every time you put them on a the spot, they never show up. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a Christian like that. Can I get an amen this morning? I, 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 just, I just, man, I don't know. I'll be 45 come April the 10th next month. And I know some of you are like, oh, you're young. You're all these things, you know. But I, I'm just, as I get older, I'm just telling you. Things change, and you know, I think about Rebecca back there and how Kim passed away last Saturday. Just, man, you know, you're not expecting that. You don't have that on the calendar. You don't, you don't see these things coming, and, and boom, here it is. My husband's not here. My dad's not here. You know, my best friend. You know, my fa- just all these different things. See, we don't know. And yet, you know, I just feel like it's time in what God has been saying. Because I don't know how you guys think that I do my job, okay? I I don't know how you think if somebody came up to you and said, hey, how do you think Pastor Matt comes up with his messages for Sunday? I'm sure some of you smart Alex would probably say, well, he just goes on the internet. You know, it's most of you bandies folks out there would probably say that about a bandy, a maiden guy. You know, to give me a hard time. I'm sure you might would say that. But here's the thing. I can't ever fully tell you how I end up where I'm at. You know, I ended up in this series with Gideon because somehow I'd written that name down on a pad of paper with a circle around it. And I just got curious. I'm like, well, how did that get there? And I just start reading it. And so I end up being in, in Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8 for a month. And then Derek and I are talking, and I'm thinking, dude, you got to come share your testimony. And we get a real live example of somebody who's been here and and came here and and just talking about this warrior spirit. And you were challenged last week that it's time to pick up the sword, and it's time to fight. But the question is, is what does that mean? If you're one of the few who are saying, man, I want to go forward, and I want to fight, and not just this, oh, I'm all these different things and, and I can stand inside a building with other believers and sing about it and do all that and I can say Jesus is this. No, I'm talking about rubber hitting the road. Let's do something about it. Amen? I understand if you're here for other reasons, maybe you have to be here. Maybe you're not really interested. I pray you get interested. I pray you get serious about your way walk with God. I pray you stop playing games, right? I pray you get saved. I do. Church, I'm talking to you this morning. So what are the marks of this warrior that God has said to his church? I see you as a mighty warrior. I see you as a mighty man, a mighty woman of valor. You are a great hero. You matter in this life. So what about those, right? What do we, what do, we do with this? How do we fight? Well, what I want to do just for the next couple of weeks leading into uh, Easter season is I want to share with you, and none of this will be earth-shattering for you, but it's, I think where it becomes a challenge is, is when do we just stop saying it, draw the line in the sand, and say, man, this is where I'm going. Life is just too short, and we never know. I'm not going to play games with it. Where do we draw that line in the sand? So what I'm going to share with you over the next couple of weeks are the marks of this God warrior. 
And you and I know that there is no greater warrior that has ever walked on planet earth than Jesus Christ, right? That is the absolute perfect picture of what a God warrior looks like, right? And so all I'm going to do today, I'm going to focus on one which I feel like for you and I as believers is the most important, okay? And so the mark, okay, that I want to talk about today is this. It is the mark of a commitment. It is the mark of a commitment to follow Jesus alone. It is the mark of a commitment, a lifelong commitment to follow Jesus alone. Let me ask you a question. Who are you following today? Maybe it's better to ask it this way. Who calls the shots for you? Who set the agenda for the, for the goal of your life? When you wake up every day, who is it that determines you know, I understand there's some things you don't control. You, you go to work, you have certain things, and I get that. I get that. But in the midst of that, what will be the agenda for your life for that day? Who are you following? Mark chapter 8 this morning, if you would, beginning at verse 27. I'm sure you're already there, but we're going we're gonna to read a lot of this scripture. But I want you just to listen carefully. I want you to kind of pretend that you're in one room and somebody's in the other room and man, they're, they're talking about you. you ever, the, ever, that ever happened to you? You know somebody's talking to you, talking about you, and you're kind of in the other room and you just kind of lean in and you're like, what are they saying? I'm going to challenge you to do that with God today. Matter of fact, I double dog dare you to do that with God today. What else can I do to challenge your flesh? You know what I mean? Offer you $100 if you listen. Would that help a little bit? <laughs> I don't know. Listen to what God says. Verse 27, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, and he said to them, who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. But then he said to them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, and he said, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Now, I want you to write down Matthew 16 and write down verse 23 and go read that account sometime today and listen to what Jesus said in response when Peter piped up and said, you are the Christ, because he praised him. And he said, you're right, you got it. And you didn't come to that knowledge through your own intellect. God revealed that to you, Peter. So he, so he praised him like, Peter, he's got that right. What you said, what you professed is dead on, Peter. But notice how this continues to follow once in verse 31, Jesus begins to lay out the Father's agenda for the Messiah. And look what happens when that agenda that the Father has for Jesus doesn't match Peter's. Let's look at it. So Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, there's a connection to Daniel. And we know that in Daniel, mainly what we see there is that the Son of Man is going to come and he's going to rule and he's going to reign forever. And for most of these Jews, that's what they were looking for in a Messiah, was a ruler, a one who was going to reign. But Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and listen to this, and be killed. But then on the third day, he will rise again. He spoke this word openly, and then Jesus, or excuse me, then Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke them. I find that interesting. Jesus, the Son of God, right? The eternal one has just now declared the Father's will. And so Peter, who obviously knows better, who knows a better path for the Messiah, comes along and is like, This can't happen. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, here's the power of verse 34. In the midst of this, okay, here's man's agenda, here's 
God's agenda. We see them both very clearly. God's agenda is that the Messiah must what? Before he reigns, he's got to what? He's got to redeem. And in order to redeem, he's going to have to die. But take heart because on the third day, he's going to rise. But that's God's agenda. Well, what's Peter's? Peter's agenda, listen to me. You, you got to think about this for a minute. Peter's agenda is the same agenda that you have and I have. Here it is. He wants a crown without a cross. Is anybody hearing me this morning? I mean, how many of you, man, any time, any time your comfort gets agitated the least little bit or somehow your plans get thrown out for the day, how many of you just say, praise God, hallelujah, thank you for stirring me up, you know, Lord, and not things not happening the way I wanted to. Anybody respond like that? Let me be honest with you. I can't speak for you. But I am ashamed to say that most of the time when my comfort gets agitated a little bit, you know what happens? I get agitated. And I start acting like a pure you-know-what. You fill in the blank. But what God is about to do right here is drop a bomb on this thing. And he wants to make it crystal clear at at this moment for his boys what really truly matters for them moving forward. He doesn't want there to be any doubt whatsoever about what is most important for their lives. So now with all that being said, let's read verse 34. Because you know this verse. You've heard this verse. So he calls the people and his disciples and he says to them, whoever desires to come after me. Whoever desires to come after me. Let me make it clear. Here's the bottom line. You must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. Take up his cross. And say it with me. And. What is the most important thing? Mark characteristic that any of God's warriors could have moving forward in this life to fight. It is a dedicated, all-out commitment to follow nobody but Jesus Christ. And see, you might say, well, you know, pastor, listen, man, I don't, Jesus is not here like he was for the disciples. Yeah, he is. You, you, You see, that's what sets him apart. That's why there really is hope for the world, because there is a living Jesus. He is alive, and he is alive in the hearts of every single believer today. And his word is alive. It is living. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. There is life here, life-changing stuff found in his word. And we can follow him because he has chosen to speak And give us very specific revelation beyond just what we have generally in the world with the heavens and the earth and with trees and the moon and the sun and the stars and all these other things that do declare his glory. They do declare his power. They do declare his wisdom. They declare his power and rule over all of this earth because somebody's got to hold it all together. And he is the sovereign one. But he has spoken very specifically in our lives and he's done it in his word so don't say you can't follow him absolutely you can follow him because we can know his heart through the word so we get it number one mark of of god's warriors warriors is to follow him alone but let's just be honest here for a minute how many of us struggle with this every day of our lives See, I've got the platform for a moment. I've got the floor right to speak. So let me just say, every day it's a struggle for me. It's a struggle. There's my way. My way is always best for, guess who? (laughs) Me. It's always best for me. Because I don't know about you, but I just, 
have a tendency and always have to, to choose the easy path. Anybody like that? So there's a struggle with this. Because we all have the tendency to want to establish the agenda every day. And that agenda will always revolve around what's best for me, what's best for mine. And a lot of times, if we're really, 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 really transparent, we have to admit we really do care a lot sometimes about what people think about us. And so a lot of our agenda is spent trying to impress people and make them think good about us, right? But the disciples struggled with this. And I find great comfort when I come to the Word of God because as we saw in Mark chapter 8, you know, Peter's missing it. He does see a little bit as you go back. When Jesus performed that miracle, when he he gave sight to the blind guy, but he didn't give it to him perfectly. He could only see a little bit. He couldn't see clearly. And then he touched him again, and he could. And so Jesus was illustrating through that miracle what's happening with all of us. It's a process. We go from one level of seeing to another level of seeing. The thing of it is, we just got to keep pressing on to do what? To see it as Jesus sees it, church. Man, I know that's hard. And I'm trying to come down. And I'm trying to get in your shoes with you. And I understand the challenge of all of this. But at some point, we got to say, all right, it is a struggle. But at the end of the day, my commitment is to follow him and see it like he sees it. Because some of us are lazy. Some of us are wasting our lives as Christians. And look, this is not a manipulation tactic, but you're standing before God, Christian. And you're going to be evaluated on everything you've ever done. And it will be determined good or bad. For the bad, you'll suffer loss. We're not talking about heaven and hell here. We're not because we've already been rescued from the wrath of God. But we are talking about eternal life and how we spend it in the future. And we're told that for the good, you're going to receive a reward. We, that's true, church. That's not bondage because I'm a child of God. I know that. But I've also been given a great treasure in his word. And I've been given a very clear assignment. Go and pass this on. Invest this in the lives of other people. And we all share that same deal. And so, man, there is a struggle with this. If you got a moment, look with me at Luke's gospel, chapter 9. We'll see if we got that one. Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 51. Just looking at a moment, if you want to just kind of put a little heading over this, the struggle of this, right? The process of learning and growing and to see things from God's perspective, to have the proper vision that we need. It says in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, you might want to underline that there for a moment, because let me just ask you something. You might know this, you might not, but what awaits Jesus in Jerusalem? Anybody know? Death. There's a cross that awaits him. Not just a cross, but everything leading up to that cross. That's what awaits him in Jerusalem. But let me just give it to you in a general sense. What awaits Jesus in Jerusalem is the agenda of the Father. The cross according to Scripture, is the will of the Father for the Messiah. And that's how we know. That's how we connect the Christ to Jesus because Jesus is the one that came along, born of a virgin, performing all these miracles, right? Dying on a cross, being buried in a tomb, rising from that tomb on the third day, ascending and then seated at the right hand of the... That's how we connect Jesus and the Christ together. Because God said, He will be this. So that's why we believe. That's why we convince people Jesus is the Christ. He's the Savior 
of the world. And so here's the deal. Here's what I see. Jesus was steadfastly setting his face to the will of God for his life. Because you know it, he's already getting it from every direction. No, this is not the path for the Messiah. This will not happen to you, Jesus. This is not the the role that that the Messiah was supposed to walk, right? He's hearing it all. I mean, he's got got people out there trying to destroy him. But what does he do? He sets his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You know what we got to learn? You know what I've got to learn in this life? That if I truly want to be one of God's warriors to turn this world upside down in the short time that I get, I've got to realize that daily i got to learn to set my face steadfastly on Jerusalem. Just meaning there's times in the day when I'm getting it from everywhere. I just got to realize that all that matters is what God wants. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. So Jesus sent messengers before his face, and they went and they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive, and the Samaritans didn't. Because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Think about that. Wow, I can't stop here. I want to. But they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't accept him because the true agenda for the Messiah was there. But their mindset was he needs to be going there, right? And why is it that they got so consumed with seeing the Messiah only as the one who would reign? It's because the one who would reign would make life easier and better for them. And how many people out there, that's really the only kind of Jesus they want, the one that's going to prosper them, the one that's going to give them help. They don't want the Jesus who's going to lead them down the path of suffering and difficulty in their life. And trust me, that option is out there for you. But if you want to follow Jesus of the Bible, the true Savior, the Son of God, I'm going to tell you, you will suffer. And Paul made sure Timothy understood that. It's coming. Because sometimes, I'm telling you, just like now, sometimes there's a wave coming and there is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. But stand there on the grace of God and know that God is bigger than whatever wave may come our way in this life. But when his disciples, verse 54, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, listen to what they say. This is kind of funny. I don't mean to be insensitive, but like, they're ready to call down fire on these people. Like, they, they're not willing to take you, Jesus. They want to reject you. Man, hey, Lord, let us be like Elijah here, and we're going to call fire down, and we're going to get rid of them. I mean, but how many of us, that's our attitude toward the world? How many, how many of us, that's our attitude? Let's just, let's just, God, can we please call fire down on Washington and all these crazy, corrupt politicians and just wipe them out? But look what Jesus says. I mean, you, you can't. See, and this is my, Matt's challenge. You see, I know I get some crazy harebrained ideas, man. I get some crazy stuff. And I know my agenda can become as selfish as anybody's out there. But here's, here's the power right here. What does Jesus do? He rebukes them. Just like he did Peter. What, what does it mean to rebuke? Anybody know? Parents, you know what it means to rebuke. How many of you got kids? Well, you know what it means to rebuke. You got to call your kids out sometimes. Hey, you're going the wrong direction. You need to stop that. You need to go here. There's a rebuke. So Jesus realized, and look what he says. He turned and rebuked them. He says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. Now listen, this is the word of God. I'm not making this up. For the son of man, Jesus speaking of himself, said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So Jesus has one agenda in this world. You know what his agenda is? Set the captives free. So why should my agenda be any different than setting the captives free? You see, Jesus is still setting the captives free. And I'm I'm either on his program, being a part of that, or I'm not. And I'm kind of doing my own little thing. Write down Matthew 15, 21. Go back and read about the Canaanite woman. And just, again, pay attention to this theme of 
the disciples thinking one thing and then Jesus doing something else. Look at John 13, verse 6. And you remember when Jesus came to wash Peter's feet, what did old Peter say? Well, he's the oldest disciple, so he's the one going to speak up. And so he's right there. Lord, you're not going to do this for me. Don't you think that's a little funny? Like, he's coming to do something for you. And you're, you're like, no, 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 you're wrong. That's not what you shouldn't be doing that for me. And then Jesus, of course, says, well, if I don't do it, you have no part in me. And so he's like, all right, you got it all now. Just wash, whatever. And even that, man, you might not agree with me, even that for Peter at that time was nothing but selfishness. I, I believe that. Because he's thinking, oh, my gosh, am I going to miss out on something? Well, go on, hit me, man. Go on, get me, get everything, you know. I, I don't I think he's even seeing it right. He's just, it's his mindset. And we'll see that played out. Not trying to be hard on him, but what will he do? He'll do the very thing that Jesus said he would do. He'll deny him three times. And he will not be there for Jesus at the time he needs him the most. Look at John chapter 18. I just thought it was interesting. I did a little study this week. You ought to go listen to it. I was looking at a verse in Luke chapter 22 where Jesus said, get your money back, get your knapsack, go sell your garment and buy a sword if you don't have one. And so I'm kind of like, whoa, whoa, what does that sound like? What's that mean? What's Jesus really saying there? Especially in light of right after that, they come to arrest Jesus and they show up with their swords and everything else and they come to arrest him, put hands on him. And what does old Peter do? I think he took Jesus literally, and what he said, he took out his sword, and what does he do? He slings it, and he ends up cutting off the servant of the high priest's ear. Well, Jesus picks the ear up, puts it back on his ear, which is pretty amazing, by the way, but I believe that. I believe that's what happened. He healed the man and basically told Peter, put down your sword. If you want to live by that sword, guess what's going to happen? You're going to die by it. You're going to die by it. So again, I just talk about, you know, our perspective and mindset going forward and how we view fighting and what we're, what we're called to do. See, the agenda is the cross. Peter, disciples, it must be fulfilled. The point is setting the captives free. The point is making disciples, church. So, as we close down I want you to take your Bible with me and look at Matthew chapter 26 so what you can write down here is the cry of God's warrior the cry of God's warrior I realize for any of you that have been in the church for any amount of time, you have heard these verses many, many times. Verse 36 of chapter 26 says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed saying this. Now just listen to these words. Just now take these words in the context of all that we have been saying. Think about the cry of God's warrior. Here's what he says. Oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I, I, I mean, who of us would want the path that Jesus had to take for the world to be saved. Are y'all connecting with me? Who would want that? I mean, Jesus in his humanity is looking at this, what has been revealed about the purpose of the Messiah. He's looking at this right face to face, and he's like, Lord, if there's any other way, just any other way. But here's the cry of God's warrior. Nevertheless, not what I desire, not, not what my humanity is desiring, but as you desire. Whatever your will is. So he comes to the disciples and he found them of all things sleeping. What's the church doing today in, in your opinion? I'm going to tell you what the church is doing. You ready for it? This is going to be harsh. We're asleep. I, I mean, we've got COVID. We've got all this. And, and we think we're awake. We, we like think we're alive, but we're not. 
Because the only way that we know we're awake and alive is when we start tuning in to what God is saying. But we're too busy listening to what social media is saying and listen to what all these other people have to say rather than diving into the book ourselves and listening to what God wants to say to us. And we think, oh, it's too difficult. It's too, I don't want to understand it. But what you're doing is you're doubting the ability of the Holy Spirit that if you put the time there and study it and seek it, God will answer you. He's never failed me in that. But if we want to be the microwave generation and do it in five seconds and we don't get the results we want, then so be it. But here's, here's the guys, they're asleep. And Peter, and he says to Peter, what? Guys, just one hour, could you not just have, come on, one, one little hour here. And then he says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Church, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And what is the temptation? Here it is. Listen, please. You will waste your life. And you're going to stand before God as a believer. And you're going to have absolutely nothing because you were so selfish. And you're going to stand there. And everything is going to burn. Everything's going to be declared bad because you chose in this life to do your own thing and follow your own agenda instead of follow Christ. I don't know about you. You don't have to be, but I'm not okay with that for my life. So he says a second time, and we finish with this. He went away and he prayed and he said, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, he said, your will be done. What what, what is the cry of the warrior? The cry of the warrior is, God, whatever path you put before me, Whatever path you put before me. Because you've already said it. The greatest thing I could ever do is deny myself, take up the cross, and follow you. You see, questions that I think are very important right now for the church are questions like, well, what did Jesus fight for? What did he fight for? Because the culture in which he was born into and lived into was much worse than ours. I mean, if we're gauging it. I mean, go back and study the Roman Empire. Look at what the Roman Empire was doing at the time. Look at their oppression. Look at all that they were doing. Look at what they even did later to the early Christians that would not bow to the, to the Roman Caesar. Look, look at what they did. You, you living in that kind of fear? Well, not yet. What did Jesus fight for? Well, here's, what I, here's what's so clear. If, and all you got to do is read it. Jesus fought for the world. The heart of the Father was for the world. He fought for the world. He fought for people. He fought to set the captives free. It's like he lived his life, and, and I don't know, my crazy mind, you know, it's like there's these railroad tracks, and you got all these people that are tied down, and the train's coming, and it's getting ready to destroy them. And Jesus came along, man, and he was willing to, anybody that would say, hey, Over here, help, set me free. What was Jesus? He's there on the spot. Setting the captives free. What about this question? What did the early church fight for? I mean, I see them allowing themselves to be abused, tortured, imprisoned, and even for some of them be killed. Because they saw their mission to give themselves as a willing sacrifice to set the captives free. They understood that. Now let me ask you something. Do we have to have a program? Do we have to set up a Tuesday or Thursday night program to go set the captives free? I I mean, just think about how much, and what happens is you might do that. And you might say, okay, and it would be a great idea. But what happens is is when the person gets glued to thinking that the only time they're going to go out and help anybody is one night a week for an hour. See, I would much rather you be absolutely, totally limitless in your ability to impact the world. And that is to go forth with God's agenda, believing every day you're looking for the opportunities. And you're looking for the sounds of the cries there on the tracks that are saying, hey, help me, untie me, get me free. Not just living to make more or be more in this life. 
but living with the mind of Christ. So look at what the early church fought for. Now, I'm going to say something this morning before we close that I would challenge, especially all of you men who have been assigned the role to be the heads of your homes. I'm going to ask you to write this down. Would you please do that for me? I want you to write this down because in in our time and day, I, I just feel like this is one of the absolute most important truths that you have got to process in your mind. Okay? Here it is. You ready? The enemy, look at me. The enemy cannot do anything to stop Christianity from flourishing. Did you hear me? The enemy cannot do anything to stop Christianity from flourishing. And you know why it can't? Because the enemy cannot stop the word of God from going forth. Stop us from meeting in this building. I promise you this, you're not shutting me down. My agenda's not going to change. Take away my Bible today. Take it. You know why I say take my Bible? Because bless God, my Bible is right here. I've got all I need right here to know how to set the captives free. Take it. Take prayer out of schools. Take it out. Because I promise you this, you really cannot ever take prayer out of school because you can't ever take the child of God out of the schools and you're never going to stop him because God never said when you prayed you got to pray out loud now he might stop the principal or he might stop a teacher or somebody from getting on the intercom and praying out loud and so be it let him do it and I can challenge all of you young people say pray <laughs> pray parents pray See, we got to be careful because I'm afraid there's a lot of believers that are actually convinced that the devil could actually come along, outsmart God, and keep the church from flourishing. But here's what I know, and I know it from reading the Bible, that the times that the church flourished the most was when they were being persecuted the most. Just read about China, read about Indonesia, read about some of these other countries where the church is growing in unbelievable numbers and their lives are being threatened. Let me tell you what God's doing. He's separating the sheep from the goats. He's separating what's real and what's not real right now. And here's what's going to happen. The true followers of Jesus are going to rise up one way or the other. And the ones that are not, the ones that are ashamed, the ones that were all about themselves, they were going to fall to the wayside. But this is going to be the one mark that will separate us from all of the rest is that we follow Jesus Christ alone. And we do it no matter what the cost is. See, I I don't know about you, but I realize the time we're past 1130. But here's the deal. If you need to leave, in all kindness, you go. But man, I just, I don't know how else to approach this. But there's just sometimes in our lives we've got to draw a line in the sand. We've got to do it, church. How much longer will we sleep? How much longer are we going to yawn through all of this and just expect that, okay, that all this is going to be taken. And yes, God is sovereign. I get it. But he's sovereign enough to say, I declare that I will use my church to be the light of the world. I declare that I will use my church to be my voice, my hands, and my feet. And the question is, who will stand up and say, God, here I am. I'm going. I'm going, church. And I'm going I'm I'm to be faithful to preach the word to you. And I'm going to continue to give this invitation. But whether you go or not, I'm going. And we're going to set the captives free. And you know what? You may or may not know about it. My name may never become anything in this world. But I can just tell you from just even the last week alone, man, God is faithful. And if you're willing and ready to, man, hey, I'm, I'll help and he will He will use you up. So, Father, we come before you today as we humbly close our time together. So, Father, 
man, I've never, I, I don't know, it's just one of those things that, I guess a personality thing, one of the ways you've made me, but, you know, I, I do, I, I realize, God, there may be some people here today that need to go, and I pray that they'll feel the ability and the freedom to get up and do what they need to do. But I also feel like, God, there's just some folks here that are tired of just professing it. It's time to stop talking about it and to start walking in it. And so in light of what we've talked about, I just feel like there just needs to be some repentance in my own life and the lives of others to say, God, I'm just going to come to you with no agenda. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to give you my yes for whatever it is that you call me to do. So, God, we're going to pray, we're going to sing, and we're going to do all those things. But I pray, whether it's in this altar or in that pew, wherever it is, I pray, God, that your people will resign in their hearts to follow you, to follow you alone, to follow your word, to follow your truth, to follow your spirit, no matter what.